medium side of the erasure. Looking at seeing, we can see the particles. You can even see the particles in here. We know that seeing the soils, their particles are large, so their pore spaces are large. Large spaces, water drain through quickly, water draining through quickly, leaches away nutrients. Why? Because nutrients are dissolved in the water. Less water equals more air in the pore spaces. Air heats up faster than water. So sandy soils tend to be warmer. Clay soils, this here is clay under a microscope. You can see that it's very flat, that they pack together um, tightly. And even when we're looking at this image, we can see that it doesn't have that nice crumb that that first handful of dark soil do. Those particles are small and flat. Their pore spaces are very small. This means that the water drains slowly. However, they hold nutrients because the water is, has the nutrients dissolved in it. One of the negative things about clay, though, is that it tends to have a low pH, which means that the nutrients that are in that clay soil are tightly bound to the clay particles and don't get easily dissolved in water and so not, are not easily available to plants. We're going to talk about that more later. Slow drainage obviously means that there is less air in the pore spaces and clay soils tend to be cooler because they have more water, so they take longer to heat up. A quick look at silt soils. Um, as you can see, looks like a mixture between clay and sand. And what do you know? Medium-sized particles, medium pore spaces. Average drainage, average aeration, average nutrient retention. You don't need to spend too much time worrying about um, silt soils because our loam soil, which tend to be silty loams, clay loams, sandy loams, these are a mixture of silt, sand and clay. And already when you're looking at this image, you can see that that is a more desirable, a darker, more fertile looking soil than the sand or the clay. Essentially, the kind of loam depends on the ratio of the sand, silt and clay. Uh, if you would cast your mind back quickly to that texture triangle, you would see that a lot of them were called loams. So the bulk of soils throughout New Zealand are loam soils. They drain well. They are well aerated. This means that they have a good amount of water and nutrients. Remember that that nutrients is dissolved in the water to be available to plants. It is the most fertile soil in New Zealand throughout the world. Very briefly, and um, I'm not going to go through this, but here are our three main soil types, um, looking at the positives and the negatives. Um, by all means, you might want to pause on that uh, through the rewatch. Uh, as you will notice, though, that I haven't really been able to come up with too many negatives, if any, for loam. Once again, they are the best. They have the best qualities of sand and clay soils. And they tend to be a little higher in organic matter as well, which is why they're darker. Okay, that's our texture. Moving a little bit on, more onto soil structure, essentially structure is that arrangement of soil particles, how those pegs are clumped together. This is important because the structure of the soil dictates drainage and water holding capacity. It dictates how much air is in there. That air that is in there it, um, is related to the gas exchange. So basically how much, how fast oxygen and carbon dioxide move in and out. And this is important not only for our soil organisms, but also um, for root respiration. The structure of the soil also dictates heat transfer. Remember we talked about air heating up faster than water, so the amount of air or water that is in the soil will dictate how quickly or slowly that soil heats up. The soil structure is essentially its mechanical strength. How does it hold together? And this will directly relate to its potential to erode or become compacted due to overcultivation. These all affect plant growth. 
but more importantly, they dictate how the land is going to be used and those management practices that we use in order to manipulate plant growth or soil uh, uh, properties to improve plant growth. Which brings us on to soil property. Now look, quite often in exams, you're going to be asked um, uh, when speaking about a management practice to describe how that practice is done and then explain how it influences soil properties. A very common mistake is to not know what those soil properties are. Essentially, there are three soil properties. You've got your physical property, your chemical property, and your biological property. However, within each of those, there are specifics. For example, our physical properties relate to, obviously, physical stuff, such as the drainage and aeration, how much water that soil can hold, what temperature it is. And as we've said before, the temperature is directly related to the air and water ratios that are in those four spaces. We're also probably thinking, actually, those physical properties are related to the particle size, the pore size, and the structure of the soil. And the structure is how those particles and those pore sizes are clumped together. When we're talking chemical properties, we are basically looking at the nutrients or minerals that are in the soil. So we talk about nutrient retention. This is the soil's ability to hold on to nutrients. If water is draining through quickly, it's taking nutrients with it. It's leaching those nutrients out. Nutrient status is how much nutrients is actually in that soil. The ability for soil to hold and the amount of nutrients that are in the soil are very important. The status and retention can be related to the soil pH, which is essentially uh, the ability of the, height, the power of the hydrogen bonds to bond minerals to uh, the uh, particles of soil that are in there. We're going to talk more extensively on that. Finally, we have our biological properties. Remember, this is things that are living or used to be alive. So, for example, all our living organisms, this includes earthworms, uh, fungi, uh, microbes, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, all of those little critters. It also will include some of those pathogenic ones, the disease-causing ones. Um, those obviously were our beneficial organisms help to improve and break down organic matter, so dead leaves, um, mulch, plant, uh, dead grasses, and that in turn improves organic matter within the soil. So those are our three properties. When you are asked in your exams to comment on them, your marker will be expecting that you are able to talk about drainage, water holding capacity, the nutrient status of soil, soil, the living organisms in there and how they decompose. I quickly want to be able to go through um, some of the reasons that air, water, uh, some of the reasons that the properties of soil are needed. Uh, so for example, with our soil water. It's needed by plants for photosynthesis, respiration, transpiration, and cell turgidity, which is essentially keeping the plant cell plump so that it doesn't wilt. And we know when we've seen plants that don't have enough water in the soil, they're unable to absorb enough water through osmosis. And so um, the plant itself actually starts to droop, but that is a direct result of not enough water in the cell keeping that plant rigid. Soil water is needed for our organisms as well. Essentially, it keeps them moist and cool, and they need that moistness on their skin or membrane because um, a lot of them, they exchange gases across their membrane. So the the Organisms exchange of gas is directly related to how moist the skin is. 
you've got really dry soil, we're not going to, it's going to kill organisms or they're going to move deeper down, particularly earthworms, um, to get away from that dry soil. And we've all seen when we've had heavy rain, those earthworms come to the surface to try and get away from the saturated soil. Essentially, uh, as I mentioned before, nutrients need to be dissolved, dissolved in water so that they can be taken up by plants. And um, this plant keeps the soil cool. Uh, which is a, um, a bonus for uh, keeping soil organisms alive and sometimes for root respiration and germination of seeds. Soil air, root respiration. It's quite important in your exam that you that you do talk about the plant roots because of course these are that's the part of the plant that is in the soil. So when we talk about the soil being warm enough or wet enough or having enough uh, moisture in it for respiration, really we're talking about root respiration. Um, the seed germination requires warmth, although not too hot and moisture um, to, to start those chemical reactions to cause seed germination. Essentially, our organisms, they need oxygen. There's that gas exchange across into their bodies for respiration. And once again, just reminding that air heats up faster than water. So air that is, soil that is well aerated is going to be warmer. Warmer soil means that those chemical reactions within the roots are going to be faster. So you're going to have faster root respiration, which means faster root growth. The larger the roots that are in the um, soil, the more water and nutrients that plant has access to. Therefore, the faster the plant grows, the higher the yield of the crop on top. And these are things that you're going to want to link during your um, when you're answering your exam. Those are the links between the describing or achieve, explaining why that has to be done or merit, and then justifying it, which is your excellent. Back to our organisms, okay? They are needed in the soil to break down that organic matter, which we probably called, called as humus, okay? Humus is high in nutrients. It's also very sticky and helps glue those soil particles and kids together. So soil organisms are directly related to recycling nutrients and improving soil structure. Sometimes we have uh, nitrogen, uh, you may have heard about the nitrogen fixing bacteria that are in, present in the soil. Essentially, they um, are able to turn the um, uh, nitrates and ammonias in, in the air in the soil and the water that's in the, um, that are dissolved in the water into a um, nitrate that can be used by plants, can be taken up by plants and utilised. Um, and our earthworms, very important. Essentially, they obviously they um, break down organic matter and their casts or uh, poos. Uh, help with soil structure as well, and they're high in nutrients. But more importantly, is they are able to burrow through the soil. They create these little tunnels that improve aeration and drainage, and those they're mixing through that organic matter. Obviously, some of them of those soil organisms can be pathogenic, where they can be pests and diseases, and they damage the plant. And Probably worth just pointing out that um, you know you can end up with various parasitic stockworms, hookworm, etc., um, in in soil, and that's one of the reasons that we would treat effluent. Our soil nutrients. Basically, these are needed by plants for all of their cell processes. Um, I've got an example here of um, um, NPK ratios. So that's looking at your uh, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphates. Um, nitrogen, 
it's worth knowing that that is for your leaf growth um, and for making the green of plants so that they're able to photosynthesize. Um, potassium is essentially for your general plant health and they're very good um, for activate, it's very needed for activating enzymes for those chemical processes in plants. And phosphates help with root, flower, and um, fruit development. Essentially, I've put, got down the bottom here about macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients are needed in large amounts. And we have a little... Uh, for those, and that's C. Hopkins Cafe Mighty Good. So you can see down here, we've got carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, sulfur, calcium, and iron, that's your cafe, and Mighty Good is magnesium. So it's an easy way for us to remember C. Hopkins Cafe Mighty Good. They are the nutrients that the plants need in large amounts and should be present in large amounts um, in your soil. Micro, uh, micronutrients needed in small amounts, still essential, but not needed in such large deposits in the, in the soil. And here we have our um, one to help us remember is mob cousin maple. So that's molybdenum, boron, copper, zinc, manganese, and chloride. So two little easy ways to remember that. C. Hopkins Cafe Mighty Good, Mob Cousin Winkle. Uh, if you can remember those and add them into your exam, that's going to definitely um, be improving your answer, pushing towards letting your marker know that merit excellence level of understanding. Just like to point out that the soil fertility is, is the nutrient status of the soil. However, sometimes because of low pH, they can be plenty of, there can be plenty of nutrients in the soil, but they're not readily available to plants because they're tightly bound to those soil particles. And lime reduces the acidity of the soil and unbinds those nutrients and makes them more available to plants. This is directly related to our soil pH. This diagram, many of you will have seen. It talks about that it shows us the different nutrient availability um, at pHs. And one thing at different pHs, New Zealand soils tend to be quite acidic. We're around in this five and a half to five, a uh, six and a half zone. Ideally, our soils need to be around in this zone. And when you have a look at the six to six and a half, you can see that the fattest bands of all our nutrients are pretty much through there. It's particularly our C. Hopkins Cafe, our macronutrients. If the soil is more acidic, so down here, we notice that the, um, a lot of our nutrients, particularly our macronutrients, are less available. That's that binding, that bonding to soil particles that I was talking about because of their hydrogen bonds. Earthworms, microbes, they like to be around in here as well. Remember we talked about um, their membranes and skins. This is too acidic for them. It is un it's unpleasant and it will kill them or reduce um, gas exchange. Okay. Essentially, that's everything that you need to know about what makes up soil and why those properties of soil are really important. We're now going to move on to management practices. So these are things that the grower does to the soil to enhance plant growth, soil health, uh, and, um, and ensure that the soil is sustainable enough in order to continuously grow um, plants uh, from year, season to season, year to year, without having its uh, structure destroyed 
um, its nutrient status, depleted its pH to acidic. Essentially, growers are utilizing soil to grow plants, to feed people and animals. This needs to be done in a sustainable way and so that the soil can continue to be used for generations to come. There are basically eight management practices that we're going to cover today. So we're going to be looking at our fertilizer application, liming and cultivation, adding compost or organic material, drainage, irrigation, crop rotation, and application. I cannot stress more, uh, stress enough, that you absolutely must know how each one of these is done. Knowing how they are done is achieved. Explaining why you do them is merit. And that is where we're linking why they're done to those soil properties and to plant growth. How a management practice is done is describing it, achieved. Explaining why, you, why the grower would do it is merit. Excellence is a little, a little um, more difficult to uh, give a set answer to on that. Essentially, excellence is looking at all of the reasons why you would do a management practice, link that to feed and plant growth, and then justify using uh, advantages and disadvantages, um, comparing it to other another practice that maybe would um, achieve a similar result or not. And the quality of your argument is, um, is what dictates your excellence. So taking all of those reasons why something is done and giving us a really good argument will give you your excellence answer. Okay. Looking at drainage. Obviously, this is used to get rid of excessive moisture from the soil. It's going to help with those soil properties of aeration, of the temperature of the soil, the presence of your soil organisms. Too much water, not enough water. That is, both of those are going to reduce your soil organisms. Those organisms are there to help with the breakdown of organic matter. And a lot of our pathogenic, pathogenic uh, microbes and uh, organisms tend to, to live, they are anaerobic um, respirers, which is probably a little bit more detail than you need, but they live in saturated soils because they don't use oxygen for their respiration. So that's why you need, why healthy soils have an, a healthy amount of um, air and water within them. Essentially, you can improve the drainage of your soil by adding organic matter, um, particularly in your clay soils, because that's going to help the particles to be further apart, or those pegs to be further apart and allow better drainage. Um, you can put a ripper through, so you've probably heard about these compacted layers. They're usually a clay pan. It means that water goes down to that certain point and then sits on that hard surface pan. Um, and so putting the ripper through will crack that up and allow the water to drain through. If you're talking about in your horticulture plot, for example, at school, having or at home, you can raise your garden beds because that will um, improve gravitational drainage. Um, clay soils have this really um, happy coincidence when you add lime to them. It means that the clay particles clump together. It's called flocculation. And it means that those clay particles become more clumpy, like sort of the shape of silk particles, and that allows water to drain through and um, air to be present, present there in, um, in the soil as well. It's probably important to point out that flocculation only occurs to cl clay particles. Uh, obviously, having an open ditch or a drain um, and subsurface drains, of which here are some examples. Uh, 
over here we have our classic Nova Flow, which is actually mostly what people do these days. These are really good for loam soils, sandy soils, silt soils. Uh, it's a plastic perforated pipe that water can drain through. Um, you put a bit of gravel over the top of it, which is what this guy's going to do soon. You can see this is actually just being laid in as they um, travel um, through the paddock. That gravel prevents soil particles from getting um, into that drain and clogging it up. Over here, we have a mole plough. This is excellent for clay soils. Essentially, this piece ploughs through the soil, creating a little channel behind it, as you can see here. In a clay soil, it cracks the soil up above it, so these become little drainage points. As you can imagine, are really suitable for the clay soils because they hold their shape. You can imagine pulling something like this through sand and it's just going to fall down on top of itself. That is why you actually need a pipe, plastic pipe or a clay pipe within those other soils. These will last 20 years if it is a clay soil and they're done properly. These guys will last easily 20 years as well. So putting in your, uh, a good quality drainage that is suitable for the soil type, you're, um, you're going to get good use out of it and you're also going to be able to justify, and there we go, excellent, uh, the use of moles and clay or plastic and sand or loam in order to, uh, a one-time cost that needs no maintenance or very little maintenance. like to just quickly run through, um, I'm not going to read all of these out, these um, linking these concepts of drainage, and I've done this for all of our management practices, this is to give you an idea of our achieve merit excellence jump up when you're using, your, um, when you're answering in your exam. So for example, if we just take this one, drainage allows for a better soil air ratio. That's an achieve point. Your merit point is saying why that is important or why that is significant. So here we go with our merit point. Better aeration means oxygen is available for root respiration. So here's the describe, here's the explain. Likewise down here, the water drains away. Hmm, no kidding, that's an achieve point, leaves room for air. Once again, less water means that oxygen is available for root growth, which will increase your plant. Now, admittedly, those two are quite close together, but more so in this first linking concept, I wanted to be able to show that you can say something in two different ways, but it's still achieve merit, achieve merit, okay? And then once again, soil is warmer, increasing growth, less water in the soil organisms, they break down organic matter, which improves nutrients, they create burrows for aeration and further improve drainage, those burrows further improve uh, uh, soil temperature, meaning that there is uh, more air, air warms up faster than water, soil becomes warmer, warmer soil increases chemical processes such as seed germination and root respiration. One thing that you're going to notice as we go through these linking concepts, there are, there are a lot of things that sound the same. So if you're going to talk about soil organisms, you're going to talk about drainage, breaking down organic matter, increasing nutrients, the burrowing, the aeration, the soil temperature, the improved plant growth, the increased chemical reactions or um, increased root respiration. For each of your merit and excellence arguments, these are the things that are going to constantly come up because essentially we do all of the stuff to soil, but soil is soil. It still needs the organisms, the water, the air, the temperature, all of those physical factors, the nutrient availability, the right pH. So 
each of your excellent answers are going to still be linking back to those basic concepts that we covered in the first half of this presentation. Moving on to irrigation. Basically, water's lost from the soil, adding water to it. That's going to add, um, affect your physical factors of water availability, temperature, how many organisms are there, those are going to break down your organic matter, that will link directly to nutrient availability. Essentially, there's a variety of ways that you can apply irrigation, and I've just drawn some up here. This here is in, obviously in a high, um, highly automated uh, glass house. Um, these are little drip lines that you would get in orchards or vineyards, and these other three are much larger scale, obviously designed for rolling over fences, um, just being trundled along. Or this is your basic K line, which a lot of sheep farmers, sheep and beef farmers are using because it's very portable. Here we've got our linking concepts. Once again, increase the soil water, achieve, increases plant processes, chemical reaction. Name them merit. Essentially, if you were to link all four of those in an argument, here's your excellent answer. So if asked to justify why you would apply irrigation to um, a soil, those achieve merit sentences in a rationalized argument saying that it's a positive. Um, is, is your excellence answer. Moving on to fertilizer application. Essentially, it's applying nutrients to the soil. It's worth pointing out that with precision agriculture these days, we don't just apply um, a random amount of fertilizer to a soil at a particular time of the year. You do a soil test beforehand to see the acidity of the soil, because if it's too acidic, the pH is too low, then it may have lots of nutrients, have high nutrient status, but those nutrients are unavailable. So a soil test would tell you what your pH is, and if it was too low, you would apply lime, which will unlock those nutrients. It would also tell you Perhaps your soil is high in nitrogen, but is actually lacking in phosphorus, or sulfur, or calcium. Um, any of those um, uh, C. Hopkins Cafe mighty good macronutrients. Or it may just show some of the micronutrients, Bob Cousin Minkle, are lacking as well. One thing that I'd like to point out, and this is a really common mistake that students make in, when they're answering, they're confused between what an organic fertilizer is and an inorganic fertilizer. Organic fertilizers are plant or animal byproducts. We're talking about blood and bone, seaweed, effluent, animal manure, any of those. Um, a common error is that, that students or candidates say, Oh, organic fertilizer is better because it's natural and healthy and inorganic fertilizers are bad because they contain chemicals. Okay, fertilizers contain nutrients, nutrients are chemicals. All fertilizers contain these chemicals. Organic fertilizers are just plant or animal byproduct, whereas our inorganic ones are synthetic and are made up of um, manufactured minerals. Organic fertilizers tend to have set uh, nutrients and it's a little bit harder to control the ratio of them. So the advantage of your organic fertilizer is that you can get it in your NPK or S ratio that your soil desires or is needed. This is now from the soil test, obviously. Essentially, fertilizer application um, applies to the soil properties of nutrient availability and status, which directly links to soil fertility. And I've just put down here again that presence of macro and micronutrients. It can be applied using an aeroplane, mini spreader, or on a smaller scale, you would do it by hand. There's a few images here. Um, this is obviously just on the back of your quad bike. 
this is a larger version of that. One of the advantages of um, applying via um, a, a truck or even um, not to a lesser extent, these two, is that it can be done through precision agriculture. So these trucks have uh, GPS tracking systems on them, so they know that they are not going over and over the same piece of land and over fertilizing. It saves money to do precision agriculture because you're not double dosing areas and you're also not under dosing some areas. So you get an even spread, which allows for even plant growth. Here's our concepts. Probably um, one, of the, one of the negatives can be um, that some of some fertilizers can be can change the acidity of the soil. Um, invariably, though, your soil test will tell you if you needed to be adding lime prior to adding fertilizer. Okay, speaking of lime, essentially this is calcium carbonate. That's what you're applying to the soil. It increases the pH of the soil, reducing the acidity and increases nutrient availability. Very important that you don't get these two confused. I would get into the habit of saying lime increases the pH of the soil, reducing the acidity. That is a very nice sentence to describe what liming does. Much like fertilizer, it's applied um, on the back of your quad bike or your airplane or your truck. I haven't gone into images on that. Uh, and these are some of the concepts for linking liming. Liming is a fantastic management practice. If you get that in your exam, you have got so much to talk about. You'll be able to just, you can talk about reducing the soil acidity, unlocking nutrients. That means that they can be dissolved in water. They can be taken up by plant roots. They can be used by the plant for um, chemical processes, increasing plant growth increasing yield of your crop. The earthworms and microbes um, prefer a less acidic soil, so you're going to have an abundance of those that are going to break down uh, organic matter, increasing nutrients, refer back to my previous statement about nutrients being used by plants. They're also going to, um, uh, the, that all broken down organic matter is going to improve soil structure, holding those heads together, or making the gaps in clay soil greater improving aeration and drainage, link that back to respiration, warmer soils, you get the idea. Okay, you could probably write two pages on liming alone. I wouldn't suggest doing that, but uh, there's plenty to write about with lime. Make sure you cover the physical, chemical and biological properties. Liming is one of those um, management practices that has plenty of influence on all three properties. Cultivation, it's essentially breaking up the soil, but if you break up too much, you're going to destroy soil structure, and that's what we call over-cultivation. So essentially, cultivation helps when you're sowing your seeds because it creates a nice fine tilt that you can, um, and that means that air and water is uh, close by the seed coat, meaning that um, germination is going to uh, be faster. A fine tilt also means that those seedlings can penetrate through that uh, layer of soil easily. Um, so you're going to get a much more even um, emergence and a much more uh, and a faster emergence. Uh, you can add fertilizer, you can turn in organic matter, particularly if you use a green crop, and it improves drainage and aeration. Obviously, that linked to temperature. Uh, very important if you are asked about over cultivation, that essentially means that you've done it too much. Uh, you have smashed the soil, soil structure, you end up with compacted soil, which means it has poor, uh, very small four spaces, that those peds have been broken up and are now lying a lot flatter. Air and water have trouble entering and moving through the soil and um, they can become waterlogged or 
if the top layer is is compacted as well, then you're not going to get good water penetration from rain or irrigation, and that can lead to surface runoff, particularly if you don't have crop such as grass or, or any kind of crop holding that soil together. Small scale, as you would do in your own garden or in the school plot, large scale with the plough harrowers. And what we talk about, um, a really good uh, thing to point out in your is an advantage is that is minimum tillage. So this is sort of disturbing the soil as little as possible. And if I take you through to these images over here, this direct drilling one up here, as you can see, it's kind of uh, three tools in one, shall we say. And yes, it, it's pushing in that organic matter. The number of times that it has to pass over is much less, as, as opposed to this one, which is really just churning up and flipping over those a, a whole layer, that whole topsoil layer. Now, sometimes this is needed because you need to break up that um, soil uh, in, in any hard pans. And particularly this image here, we can see that it's just been in grass. So if they're intending to crop that, then um, minimum tillage might not uh, be an option. Whereas this has been cropped already. And so they're trying to disturb the soil as little as possible. So minimum tillage, very positive, um, applicable in many situations, unless you have hard soil, hard pans, or soil that hasn't been cropped or cultivated recently. So you tend to plow, run the harrows over, which flattens all of those lumps out, and then your rollers. Um, I just thought I'd chuck some uh, small scale ones up here in case none of you have done any gardening, which I'm sure you have. Here's these linking the concepts um, for cultivation. Um, down here, we we're talking about that fine tilt. That means that the soil is nice and, and crumbly. And this last point here is talking about over cultivation leading to compaction. Once again, achieve merit point, achieve merit, merit, achieve merit, merit. Link all of those together, you're looking at your excellence argument. Near the end. Okay, adding our compost or organic material. Essentially, compost is very easy to do in a small scale garden. Um, it helps with your soil structure, especially in the sandy soils, because as it breaks down, it's helping glue those particles together. Also, if any of you have ever added compost to your school gardens or your home garden, you'll know that it is quite dark. Um, it's actually rotting or breaking down um, plant matter. So those nutrients are being released in there. Earthworms and microbes love it. Often you'll actually even find in your own home compost or school compost that there are plenty of earthworms and soil organisms already living in there. So adding that to the soil has huge benefits. It's quite dark, so it can improve your soil temperature of darker color helps attract um, and hold that, that sunlight warm. And it improves with water retention and water availability. So you see there all of those um, properties of soil. Um, essentially, on a small scale, you would dig it in um, you, or apply it as a mulch. Um, larger scale, is, is, I mean, it's not really covered in great depth as such um, composting, uh, but adding organic matter would be done through a green manure, which is for um, plowing in crop residue. A green manure is when you plant a crop, say for example, mustard or lupine or something with, the, with no intention of harvesting it, of waiting until it gets shortly before going to flower and then digging that, cultivating that into the soil so that that organic matter then breaks down and improves um, soil structure, water retention, nutrient availability, et cetera. Here are our concepts of linking that organic matter. I added this other piece in here as well because I wanted to talk about that the organic matter increasing soil organisms. Um, so, uh, 
probably worth pointing out, um, we've, I mean, we've talked extensively about the role that earthworms play in soil and um, in the breakdown of organic matter by um, microbes and other soil organisms. Um, that fungi live in the soil as well, and they um, tend to have quite a symbiotic relationship with plant roots, um, and they help with um, the absorption of water and nutrients, which is, as an aside, another good reason not to over-cultivate or over-apply uh, too many um, chemical pesticides or herbicides to soil. This is my second to last one, kids. Okay, so effluent, we tend to keep it at this, um, in the standard to the wash down from the dairy shed. It has to be stored and it has to be treated. So that's usually with your three tier effluent ponds. Um, st storing and treating storage, because you shouldn't be applying it too close to waterways or too saturated soils. It does improve the nutrient status of soil. It has organic matter in it, so it increases the organic matter in soil. You're basically recycling the nutrients. And you usually apply it when it's wet, so you're adding water to the soil and the nutrients are already dissolved in that soil. However, it can be acidic and that can lower your pH. We tend to put it out using a slurry truck or effluent spreader. Um, it's very important in your exam that you do not call it a irrigator, okay? You do not put effluent through an irrigator. You put effluent through an effluent spreader or an effluent irrigator. If you do not specify that it is a effluent irrigator, your marker is going to assume you're meaning something like a center pivot when what you're actually talking about is these rotating or gun effluent spreaders and this here slurry truck. You don't want to stand too close to any of those. Here's how we're linking our concepts. Once again, achieve merit, achieve merit, achieve merit. Put all of those together. There's your excellence arguments. And finally, crop rotation. It's very important if you're asked about crop rotation that you specify that it is changing the crop that is planted in a paddock or a garden each season or year or planting the same crop in a different place. Common mistake that candidates make in the exam is to say crop rotation is planting a crop and then moving it somewhere else. You need to specify that it's planting a crop, harvesting that crop, and then either growing that, that same crop, such as potatoes, in a different paddock, or planting a different crop in that paddock. It helps with your pest and disease control. That's actually why we do it. It also helps with nutrient utilization and it can improve soil structure. And that's explained on the next slide. Here's an example of our crop rotation. So as you can see, each year, I mean, this person is only growing the same three uh, vegetables, but in this garden bed, tomatoes, the following year, carrot, followed by a legume, which would be a bean, uh, beans or peas or something like that. The three garden beds and rotating them around. It totally prevents the buildup of pests and diseases. Essentially, because the plant that that pest or disease lives on or is, um, needs for survival has been taken out of the soil and is not there next season. So that organism's life cycle is broken. It has no food or host to live on, its numbers are reduced greatly or eliminated. Or more importantly, they don't actually have a chance to build up. So it's crop rotation is essential to pest and disease control. Um, it also has these other like happy coincidences that we do it for. Different crops have different root depths. And so they will grow to different depths within the soil, utilizing nutrients within those different depths. And also, penetrating into that soil so that uh, you're improving the soil structure, drainage, aeration. Um, legumes are the only plant that adds nutrients to the soil. They still take it out, 
All plants take nutrients out of the soil. Legumes contain nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So these are our clover, beans, peas, uh, lupin. So legumes contain nitrogen-fixing bacteria on their root nodules. As those new root nodules um, fall, uh, break off or um, decompose, that releases nitrogen into the soil. It is very important in your exams that you do not talk about uh, crop rotation adds nitrogen to the soil or adds nutrients to the soil, okay? If you're going to talk about adding nitrogen to the soil and crop rotation, it only happens if you, in the presence of legumes. Wow, thank you so I'm much. <laughs> I feel like I've um, talked, yeah, were there any questions or are they all just sort um, of Yeah, I just want to first off acknowledge um, an incredible run through of um, uh, very, very thorough, um, you know, very well detailed presentation on what's a, a very long, you know, standard. Um, boiling that down into, into a, an hour um, was really tricky and you've done an amazing job of it. So thank you very much. Um, there is one question. Um, for excellence, we need to justify. Um, this can be done through comparing and contrasting. Do you have any more tips on um, a good excellence justification? Okay, so um, obviously writing the how it's done, why it's done, and linking all of those um, why it's done to your physical, chemical, and biological properties. A good tip that I always give my students is that often you're asked to compare like this management practice with that management practice or two ways of doing it. So for example, maybe um, cultivation versus minimum tillage. So for whichever one you're told or you opt for, I always tell my guys to give like um, three, two to three advantages of the one that you've selected or been told and one disadvantaged. And then the other one, give two disadvantages but only one advantage. And generally, these days, our exam questions um, are asking about different ways of doing the same management practice. So tell your marker what that management practice does. What is it that is the same? So it could be comparing um, overhead irrigation to drip line in a, um, in a glass house. So you would say that they both add water and plants need water for this, this, and this. And then you could go into comparing the advantages and disadvantages of each one. Overhead might burn the leaves, might spray everywhere, drips directly related, uh, directly um, where the soil, uh, sorry, where the roots are. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, thank you very much. That's a very detailed answer. Um, the, the other things I want to say there, Melanie, um, loved what you put in about the, you know, the grade boundaries. Um, your knowledge, your very intimate knowledge of the exams is hopefully really useful for people there. Um, I love your mnemonics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, they're often a good tool for, for remembering bits and pieces. Um, and you, you highlighted some common mistakes um, and, you know, great images and enthusiasm there. So, um, Karpai, thank you very much. Um, I do need to acknowledge that I made a little mistake at the beginning of the presentation um, and there was a, on the live stream, there was a bit of a sound problem. Um, so we're effectively, for our viewers, we're effectively finished here. Um, but if you're all right, Melanie, what I might ask you to do is just run through, I think probably the first three or four minutes, if you didn't mind doing that, I can then edit the video afterwards so that anybody coming back to watch it later um, will have, you know, I can remove the problem and tag on a little bit at the end. Um, just where it's been done so that there's not that that sound problem. Would that be okay with you? That's fine. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so we we are still live streaming, but we're, we're we're effectively finished. If you do want to, if you're watching, you do want to hang around. Um, Melanie's just very kindly going to go through the first um, sort of four minutes of the presentation for us, um, just to allow us to fix up the sound issue that was my mistake at the uh, start of the the presentation. Thanks, Melanie. Um, do you want me to click to that shared screen? Yeah, I think if you could, that would be awesome. Um, the tricky thing is, is that I can't remember. 
<laughs> doesn't need to be exactly the same. Um, yeah, that's brilliant. It's looking good. Thank you. And I'll interrupt. I think we just need about four minutes and, and then I'll stop you. Oh, if you can even remember what slide it came in on. Yeah, I'll check that while you're going. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, welcome to um, a quick tutorial on um, Achievement Standard 90919, Demonstrate Knowledge of Soil Management Practices. Essentially, today we're going to have a look and focus on four areas for our revision. The first being on the type of soil, looking at its texture and, and structure of the different soils. We're then going to link soil types to their stu structural um, the structural and their physical, chemical and biological properties. We'll also have a look at management practices and how those influence these chemical, physical and biological properties of soil. Essentially, when we're looking at soil, we're talking about the first two layers of our soil profile, looking at it here. Horizon A is where all of where most of our plant growth is done and where our roots tend to sit as well. Horizon B is the subsoil. It is relevant to the standard because often our management practices will influence this layer of soil as well. So plant growth and management done mostly in Horizon A, some management practice into Horizon B, particularly if we've got a clay pan or a high water table. I wanted to talk about the four components of soil. These are the things that make soil up. So what is soil? It's mineral matter, matter which is the amount of clay, silt, or sand, little pieces of ground up rock. It contains organic matter as well, which is anything that was alive or once was alive. For example, effluent earthworms, your uh, microbes that live in there, and um, even the decomposing plant matter. Water and air is essential. And if we have a look at this diagram, we can see that, uh, that the half of soil is made up by air and water. So these is, this is what is in the particle space, sorry, the pore spaces between the particles and the organic matter. As air moves out, water moves in and vice versa. So a saturated soil would have all of this percentage, 75 to 80% of, um, so of that, sorry, of this half would be filled with uh, water. A drought uh, soil, all of this would be filled with air and would be very little water available. Running through some basic soil terms, over here we have a very nice image of a healthy, fertile looking soil. It's got good structure. So the mineral matter and the soil particles are clumped together and they're held together by organic matter. These are called soil peds. You can see those little lumps in amongst there. They're also called crumbs or aggregates. You can see that our root material plant material is in there, but you can also see that that soil is holding together nicely. It has good air and water drainage. The type of mineral matter that is in the soil dictates what type of soil it is and therefore its texture. So for example, high amounts of sandy soil, sand includes it as sandy soil, high amounts of clay will give you a clay soil. The gaps between those mineral particles and between these peds are called pore spaces. And this is where the air and water fits in. So if you've got a large gap, that's a macro pore, little gaps, micro pores, and good plant for growth requires that you've got a really good balance in those macro and micro pores available for plants. How these peds Clumped together directly relates to its soil structure. Here is a diagram. You can just see that the gaps in between our soil crumbs or peds are large. They are our micropores, and this is where the water and air moves through. Trapped deep inside these little individual peds, like these little guys here, is micropores. 
water is contained in there and this is often um, difficult for plant roots to access. Essentially, there are three basic types of soil. You don't need to know necessarily how to use this soil triangle, but it is worth knowing about it. As we can see here, in, um, these are all the different varieties or types of your soils, and they're all a combination of sand, silt, and clay. Along the bottom here, we have is increasing amounts of sand are in the soil. So we have sandy loam and loamy sand and pretty much straight sand. Here we have increasing amounts of clay. And, once, and you can see that once we get up to 50% clay, then that is a clay soil. Ideally, we're looking for these kinds of soils. They tend to be more fertile. Loams are a mixture of those three types of soil, the sand, silt, and clay particle. And if we have a look at this diagram over here, we can see that a sandy soil has lots of sand in it, a little bit of silt, and a little bit of clay. Whereas our clay soil, lots of clay, a little bit of silt, a little bit of sand. And our loam soil, our ideal soil, which has you know, nice proportions of sand, silt, and clay. Looking at our different particle sizes, you can see that sand particles are really big. So large particles is going to mean that there are large gaps in between those particles. So large particles equals large pore sizes. You can see that our silt particles are smaller and our clay very, very small by comparison. And in fact, they're, of, they're actually quite flat and sit um, on top of each other. And they slip over each other um, because they're flat. So that's when you feel the texture of clay, it sort of feels quite slippery. Looking at this diagram here, we can see what we were talking about. Large particles, large amounts of um, pore spaces. And this is where water is going to travel through. So you can see water would travel very quickly through these gaps but there is a lot of air available. Over here with our clay particles, very, very small particles and very small pore spaces. You could imagine that it's very difficult for water to travel through those little gaps, through past those soil particles of clay. So water tends to get trapped into clay. Clay soils hold on to water and they don't have very much air in them as a general rule. Whereas our sandy soils, Water drains through very quickly, lots of air. 